you've done this to me a bunch of times now on camera. So now it's your turn. At the yeah. end of the day, I want you to do the intro. <laughs> All right. Hey, I'm Mark Urbanski, CEO of Front of Masters. My background is building UIs. I've built like over 100 large user interfaces in my consulting career. And I think the most famous project that I created was the jQuery UI Day Picker. And so I've been in the, the game a long time, built a lot in vanilla JavaScript, built a lot in with, you know, every framework, probably on the, the back end and the front end. So got a lot of experience building software and I, I love coding to this day. And it's so what you're trying so, to say is that you are a front end master. You could say that, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to be in that hot seat again here soon, Mark. Yeah, right there. The I know. I, I don't know how I feel about it, but I'm going to be there soon. Yeah, teaching uh, blazingly fast JavaScript. Is that even possible? Well, Bun has definitely changed the landscape a lot. I just try. I literally tried dropping in an application. The application I'm going to be using on front end masters, I dropped it in just to see. And it's legitimately the same as like four or five perf improvements. Their integration wow. with set timeout and promises is so good that it actually makes promises usable again. The thing is, is if you have a really hot path in promises, like if you have a series of awaits, it destroys your performance. It's shocking how bad it can actually be. Absolutely. Which I did. I, yeah, and then you're teaching uh, HTMX after that, right? We're doing a little HTMX, a little short HTMX course. Um, I'm, I'm trying to still figure out what application can I do that makes sense in like a three to four hour kind of window, you know, cause you can't, it's not like you can do a whole bunch, especially, you know, you're doing a little bit of Golang, trying to keep that simple. Plus a little bit of that, you know, there's just a lot of things you have to do to build any one thing. Yeah. And I don't know much about HTMX. Maybe you can enlighten me, but as far as I know, it's kind of a DSL like for in HTML for network requests, right? So, and then it also has like some interactivity stuff with CSS, but in general, you know, it's it's more the server that's handling everything, right? In that case. That's pretty fair. That's a fair take. That's a fair take. Uh, effectively, it just has a couple data attributes or attributes on HTML to turn them into points of change in your application. And so it can say, where to get the change, how to swap in the change, how to reduce the change if needed. And then any version or any interactivity you want, you can just you can just do that in JavaScript, right? So you just have your JavaScript. Like so you can build web components, and then your web components can emit events, and HTMX can create server requests based on custom events. It can create them based on right. Rates. So well, like I said, it's, it's a DSL uh, for essentially like interacting with the server with yeah. data attributes or, or custom attributes. Yeah, that's fair. Which like our, our video player, for instance, our uh, promo player, we have data attributes on our promo player or our video player can be embedded in a lot of different ways. And we'll have data attributes that'll define like, hey, here are the endpoints, yeah. that kind of thing. And so we can just kind of pop in a new video and put it in a different context. It can, uh, we can edit annotations, we can, you know, obviously you have the video player, like the courses player, the promo player, all this kind of thing. And um, the thing with that, though, when you're marking things up with a declarative, you know, I look at like Tailwind is something similar for CSS, right? It's like a set of utilities, declarative APIs for, you know, styling your page. In this case, it's declarative attributes for interacting with the server. But then like, what are the escape hatches? You know, that's always like, the crux of the stuff like how much can you do with this data attribute building situation and then like what are the escape patches because you know any dsl like the good ones might handle like 80 percent of your use case but then that other 20 percent or whatever like i think in htmx it's like the on attribute or something like that you can actually do even more than that. This right here, here's an article where someone made HTMX for all their outer app and everything they thought was complicated, they put into React. So it's like, it's just that nice. And so React ends up creating a bunch of children and ends up uh, emitting custom events. And then the custom event is listened to via uh, both HTMX and React, depending on how they want it to do, uh, how they want it to, you know, go do something. Right. So it's a HTML DSL for interacting with the servers. So the, the server interaction piece now you're offloading to HTMX and then the client piece you're using in React or whatever. 
Exactly. Exactly. So it doesn't it doesn't eliminate the need for like any sort of UI framework if you're going to do anything really complex. Uh, I just, just handle... I don't think a UI framework even makes sense. This that's my personal take is that it never actually did make sense to begin with, uh, in the sense that you can break down everything you. At least this is personal opinion here. You can prove me wrong, um, which is that you can break down pretty much everything you do into a series of server actions and showing it to the client. Any of the transitions, the highlighting, the, the doing things, almost all of that can either be server-driven or just some small bit of you know, JavaScript to make it interactive, right? You want something that pops up as a model? Well, the reality is models are 50% of the reason why front-end sucks because you've created a state in your application that's virtually impossible to recreate with a URL, and so now you're just like, okay, what have I done? Is this actually a good idea? And what, my example of that is that when you hit the tweet button while navigating your home page, you cannot recreate that state again by just simply having twitter.com, right? Because there's an offset into some dynamically generated list that's below your model and all that kind of stuff. And so HTMX just says, if you want to do those things, you kind of got to just go off and just write your JavaScript for it. If you don't, everything else just works. Right. There's, so there's loading, like, there's spinners. That's, there's... that's what I'm talking about. Like 80% of your app you can is interacting with a server. It yeah. can be handled by HDMX. And then like if you have something very specific that's really client-side heavy, you're going to need something, right? And in our case, we don't use a framework. So we're, we're obviously in You're literally you. the perfect there's, candidate. <laughs> yeah, there's no, there's no framework at all on frontofmasters.com. Our the new search thing that we're maybe going to talk about today, that's all custom built. The player, the video player, the courses player, it uses uh, uh, video JS under the hood for some of the, but we can, we might rip that out because at this point, like even video is pretty cross browser. We only had that in for like cross browser stuff. So, but yeah, everything is custom. The only thing that we implemented, um, we're talking about like DSL, HTMX being a DSL for server communication. But um, I think for HTML itself, if you want to render dynamic HTML, um, we use lit HTML. So we, for like our data grid component and our search, uh, we use lit HTML because you can just basically create template strings and throw it at the uh, the page and render it. And it's it's super fast. There's no... JSX, there's no like ex extra data structures being created. It's just like the perfect, I don't know. Yeah. So if you need to render on the client, like that's the only thing that we do. So here's an example of HTMX. This is a purely client side interactivity point I'm doing right here. It's Conway's Game of Life. There you go. We're playing Conway's Game of Life. I can pause it and then I can actually just save. That went and stored into a database. So that mm -hmm. is HTMX. This is just the, you know, so you can separate out the two. Right? They're pretty easy to make into two different items. So it's pretty cool. I, I feel like this is as good of an example of client-side interactivity you can theoretically make. Yeah, and so you wrote the game of life in just pure JavaScript, right? Yeah, I just wrote in JavaScript attached to the page. This is before I try to... I think a web component could be pretty fun to make this happen. I don't know. I'm kind of in between on how exactly you want to do it, but it's interesting. I just yeah, wrote I mean... just simple JavaScript to generate everything. Yeah, web components are like good to have like a declarative, like I said, we're talking about uh, HTMX being like declarative attributes to talk with the server. Like obviously the component model is cool to like uh, encapsulate code and be able to yeah. have an API of different attributes to, you know, have it behave in different ways. But the only downside every... of HTMX, I would really say, is that when you're first using it, you have such a React brain that I think it's really hard. Like, I think you honestly would have no problem. You'd use it and go, oh, okay, this makes sense. This, this is how right. I do it. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you would just literally fly through it because you don't use a framework at Frontend Masters at all. So therefore, mm -hmm. you're just fine. Whereas, you know, if all you've ever done is React, HTMX is like a really big jump and it feels arcane and it feels wrong and it feels incorrect and it feels all these things just because you're just simply not used to it. Yeah, I mean, the, you're not used to the fact that the server has all the control, right? Where you're, the server's rendering all the HTML and HTMX, right? So, like, yeah. if you transition to something else, the server is kind of the source of truth. 
versus like worrying about client side rendering and that kind of thing. Yeah. All right. You want to give us a quick, uh, like three minute on this little exploration sale? Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, we're doing a hundred dollars off yearly memberships. So that's obviously cool. Um, and we launched, uh, the search feature. So if you go to, I mean, it's better if you're logged in, but if you're, if you go to frontofmasters.com and you hit the search icon or whatever, uh, we built this, you know, super fast search that searches everything across the platform. And, uh, the team built it in go, uh, with, um, AWS open search. And then again, the, the client is, is vanilla JavaScript with, and someone was talking about lit, uh, lit element, and we don't use lit element. We only use the lit HTML package, which is the renderer. It's, it's like three kilobytes. That's, that's like the only dependency that we have on, on the search and the entire search, this interface, the ability to, you can click into like, see where it says matches 21 or whatever. Yeah. You can click in there and you can see exactly where OCaml is mentioned in each video. And you can click into that very specific part of the transcript. So oh, that's through. super cool. So you can actually go straight to that. Oh, I'm not logged in, but you could go straight to that yeah. point within the video. Yeah, within the video. And so, and this search is embedded everywhere on the site as well as inside the video player. So if you want to search a course or you want to search across the whole platform. And again, it's like, a thousand lines of client side JavaScript, like that's it. And this three kilobyte lit HTML package. And then it's built on, you know, go in AWS open search. So it's just like, look at that super, super fast and lightweight. That's me talking about LRUs. I remember saying this. <laughs> there you go. That's actually super cool. Yeah, go by the way. <laughs> Someone said. Right. Yeah. So yeah, the the whole site. Yeah, people constantly ask like, how is the the site so fast? Like, we get tons of comments on Twitter and LinkedIn and all over the place. Like, and so that's it. It's uh, as little JavaScript as possible, and rendering as much. Keep it all in the Go land and keep it fast and and Go too. Like we we keep to the standard libraries as much as possible. So it's, it's that same philosophy, like our CTO kind of has the, the same philosophy uh, on the back end as, as I do on the front end. And, and, you know, our entire engineering team, obviously. Yep. All right. So what, I, I got an important question. I get this constantly. Yeah. Everyone, even just today, they said, I can't buy a subscription to a place called Front End Masters. It's just Front End. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we started there, right? So I spoke at like 60 different conferences and met everybody in front end and like taught workshops. We're talking about 12 years ago. Yeah, you wrote jQuery date picker, right? Yeah, the jQuery the UI date, date picker. picker. Anyone that's from that era knows date picker and it is clearly the greatest plugin of all time. Well, it solved 100% of everybody's use cases at the time, <laughs> right? So it's like, it had every option in the world. We're talking about like declarative, you know, markup. Like in this case, it was like, you know, a JSON object that you could just throw up, you know, there's like 50, 60 options and they all work together and they handled every single possible use case. And so obviously the code itself was like, ended up being bloated and we kind of split it apart and all that kind of stuff. But that's, that's 15 years ago, you know, 16 years ago, something like that. When I, I think it was like 2000, six or 2007 when i wrote it in vanilla javascript and then jquery came out and i was like this is amazing like because i wrote all these components and back when you had to smooth things over with all the crazy yeah APIs there's no sizzle back then six and all that kind of stuff yeah yeah if you and don't so, know what sizzle is it just shows that you just don't know the pains of, <laughs> of growing up there was no sizzle at one point you had to make everything work yourself absolutely dustin diaz's post like top 10 javascript functions from like 2005 was like my bible it was like amazing <laughs> so, anyways so <laughs> this is like way way back in the day but yeah jquery ui day picker and all this other stuff 
you know, interacting with, uh, you know, components and all that kind of stuff. So that's my background, uh, teaching on, on JavaScript, uh, back then. And so, yeah, that's where front end masters came from, right. It was, was, it was all about front end and over the years, over the last 10 years, obviously our audience has grown. People have become leaders and organizations, which is wild. And like, you know, they're asking for fundamentals and taking our approach to, you know, the server and DevOps and all this other places. So yeah, we have all that content. We have Rust, we have Docker and containers and we have all this other stuff, but it's like, man, we spent a lot of money to try to rebrand and the de- people are asking like millions of dollars for these domains, you know, and yeah. you got to get the social accounts to go with them and all this kind of stuff. It's you got it's millions wild. and then more millions and then more millions. <laughs> Absolutely. So, so, so without telling yeah, us any of your it's names, it's an identity crisis, but <laughs> it is an identity crisis without telling any of the names you were going to choose estimate how much it would have cost you to be able to switch to a name that's more generic, if you will. Oh, well, the one that we loved, it was uh, well over $2 million. And that's just for the site, right? So the domain, yeah. He, he basically, he said, we'll start at seven figures. And I was like, start at seven figures? Are you kidding for this domain? So, <laughs> yikes. So it's like, okay, if you search on front of masters or search front of masters across Twitter, across LinkedIn, across whatever, Google, whatever, like we've got a well-loved brand right like people people love the quality of these courses and so it's like to to switch is a big thing it's it's a lot of time and effort from the entire dev team and yeah obviously a lot of money if you want a good domain and a good brand like and people are just asking exorbitant amounts for these domains these days it's insane so yeah yeah, I assume backend masters was too expensive as well. Uh, backend masters does not sound like a training website for coding. <laughs> it really just doesn't, just, does it? It, just doesn't, no. it doesn't have that ring of educational pursuit, does it? It does not. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, we even looked at, we bought dev, so we have devmasters.com. And that's a great one, but like there's a company in, Irving, California, that has like a training platform or a training like in person thing, and they I think they do some online things called Dev Masters. So it's like if we rebrand it there, then we're gonna get sued. It's just like yeah, what do you do, man? What do you do <laughs> when you have a loved brand and people don't care? It seems like people don't care, uh, except for when they first hear about it. You know, they first hear about like oh, there's a Go course or whatever, like you know, initially, but in general, like our customers are watching the heck out of all of that content, go rust, Docker, whatever they're, they're learning it on there. So, so how come you don't have uh, any little blips here to help people understand that, right? Advance your skills, TypeScript, go rust, Docker. Yeah, I think we, uh, we changed the title on like our our Twitter and all that other stuff to like front end to full stack. And even when you click join, but where does customer acquisition come from now? Um, big red, yeah, button. mostly <laughs> that's where it comes yeah, from. Big, big red, red button. button. Most, yeah, mostly word of mouth. I'd say it's like at this point, 40% word of mouth. And I think it's like 30%, you know, Google and, people searching us in various platforms and that kind of thing. And then like 10% social media and, and the paid, like we do a, just a couple paid sponsors. And obviously we, we donate more to open source than we spend on, you know, sponsors. That's so. good. I think that's a good move. Um, Cause open source, there's, there's only an article every 15 minutes describing and lamenting this current situation of open source. So that's probably a good move to keep doing that. <laughs> All right, I got, I got, I got a yeah, good no. question for you. As a front end sure. master, what do you think is the most important thing you should consider when creating a front end? That's a heavy question. 
Um, I think when you're choosing your tools, like like we were talking about HTMX, right? Like what are the what are the needs of my app? And as it grows, like how do I extend this? Like what is my plan to extend it? What is my plan to customize it? Like you can start as high level as bootstrap as you want and like in certain circumstances and you can get a UI going and it just works, right? Or or Tailwind is like one set lower, like shad cdn or whatever that uh whatever it is it's like a ui component library there's all these layers of abstraction right and whether you're using react and you're creating your own uh your own components and you're thinking about your apis and that kind of thing it's like what level of abstraction are you going to go and then as the needs of your app change like how are you going to extend things right how are you going to handle that 10% of use cases uh, that are difficult in your app, like, and really think about those. I think that's, that's where like the hardest part of, I think, front end, you know, so in our case, we chose zero abstraction. We just want to build right on language patterns because guess what? The code I wrote in, uh, you know, 2014 or 2017 or whatever, like, I still look at that and I'm like, that's great. Like we can use some new new features or whatever from the language and uh it just lives forever right and so that's the the uh level of abstraction we didn't need the quick wins that you get from frameworks in the early stage we'd rather like think about the problem ahead of time and just use language patterns and principles uh to address things and then that code will live forever and it's easily extensible and now it's like we dropped in the search the search works with the courses player. And so now we have two custom systems that work together. We don't look at the code and be like, oh, yuck. It's like, no, that code is really fast and performant. So we chose, you know, zero abstraction, but you can go one layer deeper and you can go with, you know, HTMX, or then you can go a layer further and go with, you know, something like Svelte or whatever. And then uh, obviously, if you need something from this giant React e ecosystem, or your company uses it or whatever, like you need to be awesome at, at that and and understand, you know, when it makes sense to use various patterns and how you're gonna escape um, when, you know, the component API doesn't match what you need. Now, how do you escape out of that and how do you create something custom to fulfill the, the difficult use cases in your app? And so I think that that's what you have to really consider when it comes to a front end and choosing, you know, understanding what layer, layer of uh, abstraction you're willing to deal with and then understanding when things get hard, like where are the escape hatches and how can you make those like difficult use cases uh, work? Yeah, you know, we, we have a lot of those at Netflix, um, you know, because what people don't realize is that apps live on until the company dies effectively. And you rarely get to rewrite. Very few companies get the chance to just full rewrite. And so, I mean, I'm still considering edge cases when I have to do some underlying, you know, performance feature work, whatever, for uh, using unsafe component uh, components will mount. Component will receive properties, right? We still have a bunch of class-based components, and sometimes that's the only thing that makes sense. And even though it's not supported in current version of React, we have to make things support it. We have to make things work out even at that like very far layer. And so it just goes to show that it's not as simple as people you know, make it and that the needs of your application or the requirements of the framework can change underneath you. And now you have to deal with the complexity of that. And so I, I, I get why you'd want to, you know, I get why the no framework choice could probably in the long run be the best choice. But I think it's very hard and it, it's just not a... Um, it's not really part of the zeitgeist at all to think of things from first principles, but more to think of them from, you know, starting way out and like, okay, the default choice is React just because it's the most popular. I'll start there. And then as the problems come up, you have to find exceptionally clever solutions around making these two things communicate. Like communicating from the search bar to a video player is non-trivial in React. There's quite a few layers of abstraction you're going to have to hop through to be able to make these things, you know, run, whether you're doing, you know, some... There's a lot. There's a lot of things. Context would probably be your friend there, but nonetheless, you still have to do a bunch of kind of weird tree visualizations to make all that stuff work, which is just much harder. Yeah, I mean, 
that that courses player is completely customizable you can open and close drawers you can you know now you can search and click through you can take notes you can do all this stuff right and it's it's like uh because all that's built you know custom like it, it's like it's easy to to see underneath like every line that makes that happen yeah right and so there's no like Oh, why did the, this thing like render a bunch of times and like we're in an infinite loop or why are we out of memory or whatever? You know, why why is uh, Chrome eating the memory on my computer or whatever? Uh, because there's no like double upping with, you know, all these libraries talking to each other and JSX and, you know, hopping between frameworks and all that kind of stuff. It's, it's just like, hey, look, this is where it happens. Here's the exact lines. And so, yeah, people, I think the, yeah, like you said, it's not part of the zeitgeist because it's, it's not, you know, it's just like, that's not how we do things. Like yeah. it's too hard, right. Or whatever. But I think uh, in the long run, it's paid off a ton for us. Well, Hey, thank you very much, Mark. Have a, have a beautiful day. You too. Bye. <laughs>